Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this year's uh, Agritechnica supported webinar series of the Root Camp. Today's topic is how robotics is actually changing the agricultural world. And um, I'm very happy to have with me uh, Stefan Meldau uh, from KWS, uh, Marta Wenzel from Itari, uh, Florian uh, from Muddy Machine, and Niels from DigiFarm. So it's an international uh, podium. And um, after a short introduction of uh, RootCamp, uh, I will hand over to the panelists to introduce themselves and then we go over to the podium discussion and uh, tackling a couple of questions you all bear and how the future will be changed by uh, agricultural robotics. Um, to move on, uh, I'd like to uh, show you a little bit about the RootCamp. Uh, what is actually RootCamp um, doing? What are we uh, what are we up to? Rootcamp is a multi-corporate innovation hub. Um, we are supported by K plus S, for example, as a, um, a fertilizer company and also by KWS, a seed, seed producer. Um, and we try to build an ecosystem and connect startups, bring the inspiration uh, towards the, the industry and have it scale in a cooperative way. Um, how are we doing it or what are we aiming for? We are um, having a startup acceleration batch that is uh, actually running right now, but we are also open for established companies, established technologies um, to bring them in and hand it over uh, towards the, the industrial partners. And as a third part, we are also um, open for entrepreneurial incubation. So um, innovative thinking employees come to us and we help them to uh, to their to their productive uh, MVP. What makes us unique? That is the connection between startups and corporates. Um, we have structures that the um, corporates are actually um, not only uh, choosing the startups and we are sorting the startups out, but we make them the both parties work together. And based on the on the initial fit, we create um, or we are the catalyst for the cooperative um, project that is after the acceleration phase, normally the, the phase that uh, is being conducted. Our focus is the agri-food value chain. We start at the soil, soil health, seed for the soil, um, but uh, we are also going all the way to the sustainability side. Bioeconomy is a, is a big topic of us, um, and that also leads to the circular economy that we are focusing on right now. Um, we are not doing it alone. Um, we also have a, a second location in Leipzig at the Spin Lab. They are focusing on energy, smart infrastructure and, and digital health. And uh, the root camp is supported, as I said, by the corporate partners of K plus S, um, KWS, and also we are partnering with Agritechnica, um, KPMG is supporting the actual batch, and also uh, the local economy support agency, Hannover Impulse, is supporting us here. Um, just again, what are our, uh, our offers? We offer inspiration, uh, we offer validation of technologies, and we offer creation of technologies that uh, with different programs, both or all of our programs are having an initial phase that is um, for the acceleration batch, which is an educational phase of three months, but then we hand over to, to the second phase, to the integration or implementation of the technology. That is uh, our offer we try to bring technology into, into reality. As I said, for, for early stage startups is the acceleration, later stage startups um, will have a sideway um, in, in entrance uh, to our ecosystem. And we are also uh, doing the same for entrepreneurs. Our uh, portfolio um, uh, consists actual on, uh, on 12 companies. Uh, five from the last batch, um, seven in the in the current batch. The next batch will be starting in uh, mid of May. Um, the application are currently open, so please, if you're interested, uh, go to to our website and um, apply to our next batch. Uh, cutoff is the 15th of February. That's from my side. Um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Stefan Meldo. Um, who is, as I said, supporting the uh, robotics part of uh, KWS. Yeah, uh, thanks, Philip, uh, for the introduction. And I'm excited to be here today. 
Um, I want to share a few slides with you about uh, KWS and why we are active, let's say, as a seed company in the uh, robotics area. So uh, KWS is a seed company. We are um, number three in Europe when it comes to seed sales, number five worldwide. We have around uh, 6,000 uh, employees and are active in more than 70 countries. And myself, I'm actually in the business unit uh, Sugar Beet, which uh, deals with sugar beet seeds. Um, so here you see um, an overview to, let's say, countries where sugar beets are sold worldwide. And as uh, KWS, we have around 64% market share and also innovation lead in, in that area. And um, if you look in the middle here, you have uh, this orange cluster, which is the European Union. And in the European Union, we will have some uh, challenges in the midterm um, for farmers um, to, uh, let's say, grow their crops, uh, including sugar beet. And some of these challenges are actually coming from the uh, European Union Green Deal. And uh, two of the targets you see here, uh, reduction of um, chemical pesticides by 50% until 2030, and also an increase in organic farming up to 25%. And um, this is um, challenging for, for, for farmers and the whole industry to reach these goals. These are ambitious goals, but I think it's achievable. And um, especially um, uh, for sugar beet, this has uh, quite some implications. And um, you see some of these implications here. Uh, one of the implications is on uh, weed control. So weed control is the highest cost factor if uh, farmers grow sugar beet. And uh, at the moment, uh, so this was last year, but uh, it's the same this year at, for the time being, most of the weed control is done chemically and we have some area with a combination of uh, chemical and mechanical weed control. But we think um, that the uh, Green Deal initiative um, and uh, the innovation in this, in this area, in this weed control area, will change um, the way how weed control is done here. Um, it will be much more diverse uh, than today and it will still include uh, most likely chemical uh, weed control, but um, as the Green Deal um, suggests uh, a reduction by 50%, and then we would have a um, combination of chemical and mechanical, but also a lot of uh, precision weeding technologies. And we already see in this area um, a lot of startups uh, working on um, producing solutions uh, for weed control, uh, for sugar wheat and other crops, um, mostly specialty crops. And um, to work together with these startups and to test these systems, we have created the Future Life a robotic weeding in the field framework. We work here together with um, um, Agricultural Research Institute, the Institute for Sugar Beet Research at the University of Göttingen. And within this framework, um, also within the funding of uh, farmer space, um, we are testing innovative technologies um, for weed control really in the field under real world conditions, uh, look for application potential and bottleneck, and also then share this information with global, the global sugar beet farming community to also give an outlet uh, to startups, um, to, uh, to the customers at the end. Um, the test location for looking at uh, such robots is our um, organic farm in Biebrechtshausen. So uh, we have around 400 hectares uh, organic uh, production in this area. And uh, the person who leads this farm, he has more than 20 years experience in organic farming. And this is, let's say, a perfect um, setup frame to test um, um, mechanical weed control systems, but also other uh, weed control systems and compare this to how it, uh, it's done um, in organic farming at the moment. So here, just a few images of systems that we have tested in uh, 2020. Uh, these are three robotic systems, one from uh, Eco Robotics, a uh, and spray system, uh, then mechanical weed control system uh, robot from FarmDroid, and also um, a mechanical weed control system from Farming Revolution. And uh, we have continued last year to test uh, three other systems. So we are let's say, not only focusing on pure robotics, but also, let's say, part of the weed control that is automated um, can be also considered as, uh, let's say, partial robotic solution. So we are also looking at tractor hitch systems that, such as the Robovator or this MWLP weeder. Um, and we are continuing, of course, this year um, with uh, the weeding challenge with other providers of um, mechanical and, and other means of weed control in sugar beet. 
And if you want to learn more about, um, you know, what kind of <clears throat> results do we have from such tests and to see videos, uh, you're welcome to check out our online content. If you type in future life KWS or um, world of farming KWS, you will come to, to this information. Um, to end, um, I want to um, yeah, offer um, this um, kind of um, interaction with, with startups to the community. Um, so if you have, if you are working on robotic solutions for weed control, but also for, for scouting in the field, um, then um, please uh, contact us. Uh, we can help you with benchmarking under realistic conditions. We have a global outreach to farmers. Um, we also have possibilities via our investment arm to do investments into startups and to collaborate, um, for example, on sales R&D or on the agro-service part. So up to now, um, we have uh, seven projects in five countries and um, I hope and I'm sure uh, it will also grow in the future. So thanks for your attention and um, now I will hand over to Marta. Perfect. Thank you, Stefan. I'm just sharing my screen. So yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for having me today. I'm happy to share um, our approach to agricultural robotics, which is our equipment carrier, Iteri. I'm Marta. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Iteri. And um, yeah, before I present to you the system uh, in detail, I would like to quickly explain why we developed the system in the first place. So we are a team of uh, three founders who do have a strong connection to agriculture. Two of us uh, three grew up on a farm and really experienced firsthand the troubles the farmers are facing. And well, since then quite some time has passed and nowadays, especially vegetable farmers are faced with quite a few more challenges that all yeah, really come together. Um, one of them being for sure the staff shortage and this combined with the work intensity leaves the farmer basically with no time to handle all of his or her tasks in one single day. In, in addition to that, uh, growing vegetables becomes harder because of the increasingly extreme weather. And we are we at Iteri are convinced that there is a huge potential to mitigate these problems by yeah, first getting to know the crops and the growing environment better through monitoring and also through data collection. And second, by automating specific tasks uh, in the farming processes. And yet, the, as the tasks and the correlating problems are very diverse and vary between farmers, we designed the Iteri as an equipment carrier, simply based on the very tried and tested concept of a tractor. And this will allow the farmer to tailor the device to his or her individual needs and we are starting off with uh, monitoring the microclimate and uh, a mechanical weeding tool for green salad. Through corporations, we will also quickly integrate more applications that eventually um, yeah, will make the Eteri a useful companion for the farmer in season. Yes, and because especially in vegetable farming, crops immensely vary in size and in growth stages, the Eteri can be manually adjusted in height and width in yeah, a matter of just a couple of minutes. And this allows the use on different plot widths and in different crops at the same time. The three wheels and also the 300 single wheel steering makes it uh, possible for a small turning radius, which is ideal for very small plots and as well for greenhouses. And I also brought a quick video to show the Eteri on the field and in action. And the idea is basically that the lightweight design enables an effortless transport, space saving storage, and that the farmer can get the system ready independently in just a few steps. The equipment carrier is 100% electric and can already be used in existing field structures uh, right now. And you can also uh, see different the different track widths uh, right here. And yeah, usually fields have very challenging terrain. And with our high performance motors, the Eteri can really cope with mud and slopes and also rain. And in addition to the modular concept with uh, very yeah, standard industry components, uh, we uh, we aim that individual parts can easily be maintained or replaced. 
Yeah, all in all, the Eteri really is aimed to be a reliable and robust companion for the farmer that uh, easily integrates into uh, the farming processes. And this leads me uh, to uh, yeah, our business model. And this business model is based on the foundational features of the Eteri being, as I just said, the easy in-farm integration, then the automation of uh, different processes, also the AI based precision farming and lastly the reporting and analysis uh, for the farmer. And based on these, we develop our tools uh, internally and also in cooperation and uh, yeah, with with equipment manufacturers together, we want to build different applications which will be offered um, then in the Eteri as a product or uh, starting with uh, the service and then with an increasing application portfolio, um, the farmer can buy the Eteri um, as a whole product as well. Yeah, and that's it already from my side. Uh, if you want to learn more, please uh, feel free to get in touch. Many thanks, Marta. So we're handing over uh, to Florian to see more of this sprout. Florian? Yeah, perfect. Hi. Yeah, so you can see me okay. You can hear me okay. Um, perfect. So it's a great honor to be here as the only non-portfolio company, but maybe as a local boy from Braunschweig, I get a little bit of credit to, to show up anyways. Um, no, you had been uh, what you had been a finalist in, in our selection process. So um, I was just feeling, sure. feeling bad that we were not a, a portfolio company, but that's um, that's that's uh, no problem at all. Um, so hello from London. Um, we're Muddy Machines. Uh, we are about a, a year and a half old um, company. We are um, seven um, engineers working away at our robotic platform. Um, Marta has already done all the work for me in terms of outlining the, the problems in, in horticulture and uh, we completely agree labor shortage is a crippling um, problem. Uh, here in the UK, we've kind of created the, the perfect storm with uh, COVID and Brexit and all sorts of other issues um, that I now know, I now know that other countries are heading into that direction as well. They, they build walls in Mexico, they uh, do other things that don't really help their labor supply. Long story short, um, if we don't help horticulture with automating or, or solving their labor supply, uh, we're going to have a significant reduction in locally grown fresh vegetables. We cannot import our way out of it. I mean, the other countries are also going to think twice about where to send the nutritious um, produce. So since this is a robotics talk, you will probably guess we are also building a battery powered lightweight uh, platform that operates autonomously in the field and can tackle these labor intensive tasks. We've gone for a little bit of a radical approach. We start with harvesting, uh, which is the hardest thing to do, arguably, um, and is at the same time for especially the, the specialty um, selectively harvested field vegetables. That's the biggest cost, that and the, and the pack house. Weeding is definitely also on our roadmap, uh, but we also see some uh, opportunities here that we can do in terms of what kind of grading can we already do in the field while we're harvesting to take a little bit of labor pressure out of the pack house? And what can we do in terms of data supply to the grower, right? Because if you're driving through the field, harvesting vegetables, you know exactly how much is grown day after day. And so you can quite simply present that back as a yield map to do some forecasting, to do some analysis and to allow for additional inspection. Um, as I said, we're building a platform and we're planning to tackle as many currently very manual labor intensive field vegetables as possible. We have been lucky enough to um, come across the largest asparagus grower here in the UK. And um, that's what led us to build first a harvest solution for green asparagus. Um, I'll show you a quick video now uh, where we hear from the grower directly. I think nothing replaces uh, the, the validity of the of the grower actually talking about the solution. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with a little bit of our outlook, what other crops we're working on. So let's hope the video works for me as well. 
hard is it for farmers at the moment to find workers? It is really, really difficult. A shortage of pickers on farms. We've seen many, record many amounts years. go to waste to find a robotic tool to cut us barren, but the technology is there. This isn't about saving money on labour. We, we can afford the cost of the labour, but we can't get it. We're Chris and Florian. For the past year, we've been working on a field robot that can harvest green asparagus. Countries like the UK need new technology to become resilient against labour supply shortages and have a secure and sustainable domestic food production system. We needed to design a workable solution whilst not having access to the asparagus fields because the season is only 12 weeks long. So we built our own and 3D printed some. After several feedback loops with John and getting through adverse weather conditions and COVID lockdowns, we finally got there. We've got a working machine and we call it Sprout. I cannot believe that they've made so much progress in one year. They've worked away in my fields and we've actually got a machine that takes itself up and down the rows of asparagus and harvests the asparagus and puts it in the tray. We've seen some rapid growth in the last year. We've won an Innovate UK grant together with Cobbury Farms to develop our asparagus prototype further. We've done a funding round and managed to hire some really smart engineers. We've won another grant, we won pitch battles, we got invited to accelerated programs and we are now getting slots at speaking events over the wider industry. And now we're working on the next generation of Sprout. It's battery powered, enabling a green future for agriculture. It's lightweight, which means it doesn't damage the soil as it drives over it. It uses deep learning to detect the crop. It drives itself, avoiding obstacles as it goes. Our patent pending harvester cuts consistently and precisely to the grower's specifications. Join us to revolutionize the future of agriculture, build some really cool stuff and make a big difference to farmers. Okay, that was a brief cutoff of the promotional video. Thanks for watching. Um, but obviously we are going beyond that, right? We are also working on tender stem broccoli together with Barfords of Botley, another large grower here in the UK. Our business model is also um, trying to make it as easy as possible for the farmer to adopt our solution. So we are providing a harvest as a service uh, to Cobri Farms. We are hard at work right now to finish the assembly of our next generation machine to hit the field in early April and harvest several tons worth of green asparagus for John. Um, and then we want to do a large funding round so we have enough money to build more machines for next year. Um, John just told us if this machine works for me this year, I'll order 100 machines for next year. I mean, he's running an operation where he needs a thousand people to harvest his, his crop. So ball is in our court uh, to deliver this. Okay, and over to who's next? Niels? Niels. Yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Niels, uh, one of the co-founders and CEOs of DigiFarm. I'm thrilled to be here, so thanks. And I'll just preface by saying we do not build robotics, but I'm thrilled to be here anyways. But I'm uh, I'm a 15th generation farmer, so I feel like I got my feet in both areas here, and and it's an exciting space to watch. Um, but we uh, we started uh, we're an agtech based startup based in Norway. We started in 2018, and we saw the kind of boring problem, but it's uh, boundaries. So field boundaries is you know kind of the, the fundamental layer for any digital agriculture, and uh, you know existing data when it comes to cadastral and and uh, you know clues in the US and LPAS data in Europe, it's outdated and accurate. So of course this kind of affects the entire value chain and and what we're doing is 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 being able to kind of close this gap. And boundaries is having a little bit of a renaissance now with you know robotics. It's important you have accurate field boundaries and RTK is expensive. It's not that scalable. So we're trying to kind of close a loop here. But we use uh, super high resolution satellite data to detect field boundaries and uh, we deliver this to agribusinesses across the value chain. So on the both the B2B side and B2G. And uh, robotics is also interesting for myself being a farmer. So yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good to have you. Um, so we, we have seen a little bit. Uh, we uh, have a real farmer um, in the panel. Um, uh, let, let's move on uh, with Stefan. So uh, you have sort of a meta perspective on it. You are testing different concepts, different um, teams also, but uh, also different machines. So where do you think um, is there still a need? Uh, what for capabilities does a a uh, robot needs, so you are happy to use it. And which concepts do you think are promising? 
You're, you're muted still. Yeah, um, I think what is really needed in this area is a use case, that a business case that is specific enough. So I see many of these uh, robots that are or startups that are popping up. Those who are successful have really can really solve a specific uh, need for a farmer. And um, I think what we have seen also from um, from Florian here from Muddy Machines, um, there is an urgent need that has to be solved and you are directly tapping into that area. And um, I see this also with weed control. Uh, some companies which highly focus to solve this specific problem, um, they are successful um, and they quickly get um, customers because um, there is an, a huge need to, to, uh, to replace human labor, especially in organic farming. Now, and, um, but this, this is the, the one hand. On the other hand, um, if you have um, a good platform that can integrate several solutions, I see this rather the, the second step then. Um, this, this is also needed in the future because once you have solved this specific slot, the specific spot where, I, where you are in at the moment, you know, you also want to expand to, to different areas. And, and there um, it will be interesting in the future to see, you know, from this highly specific robot to platforms, how this how this all merges. So uh, do we see then a, a multitude of robots on each farm solving specific problems or do we have larger platforms that move around and then have implemented the tools? I mean, that's that will be an, an, an interesting future to see how this how this happens. And, and one, I think one important point for from a farmer's perspective is um, to reduce the, the, the boundaries or the barriers uh, um, um, for the farmer to use these systems. Um, it has to be simple. So the, you, you have to have kind of plug and play system that you can start in your field. Um, otherwise, it will get quite complicated and um, this will cause maybe some resistance from from farmers uh, to apply these systems in the field. Um, now, so if you, for example, I don't know um, how your service model works, Florian, um, if if you operate the robot by yourself and have some operators or will this be done then by the farmer um, to work with these robots? I think these are interesting questions. Yeah, it's a fluent yeah. transition, right? So in the, in the beginning, we are operating these ourselves. Um, that gives us a chance to get better at the user interface and the usability. And obviously, we don't want to replicate the supervisory operations that the farmer already has, right? So a team leader who runs 20, 30 people in a harvest shift, they need to be able to operate a swarm or a herd of our robots. So mm -hmm. there is a transition from us doing the harvest to ultimately just providing the machines as a service. But from an environmental footprint point of view, I don't want these machines to go in the shed, like next to the combine and wait for the rest of the year. They should be used from another for another grower by the same grower for a different crop. So we get like equipment utilization year round. Mm -hmm. So we heard that there are different modules that obviously need to work together. So Marta, uh, you are uh, very focused on, on your drive train. Um, how do you see the technology evolving? What do you need um, to, to have the whole concept? So there's the, on the one side, you could uh, be the OEM, yeah, deliver everything. On the other side, there will always be some topics, some niches that um, uh, you, you can tackle. So uh, that uh, speaks more from an, or for an open platform. So what, what is your positioning there? You're muted as well. Yeah, I think it's especially in agriculture, it's uh, it's difficult to to aim to yeah build everything uh, on on one's own. So collaboration, in my opinion, is very key. And yeah, the the technology is still, let's say, the agricultural robotics technology is still very in its beginnings. And especially here, it's important to uh, collaborate that the different stakeholders from uh, different sectors of the agriculture uh, come together and work, um, yeah, on yeah solutions that benefit all of them, uh, let's say, um, with regards to standards and robotics. I think that's also something um, which, yeah, where still some um, improvement uh, possible. 
Okay, so what do you think what the, uh, what the different um, uh, elements need to need to serve for? So we have the software side, we have the content side, which is uh, the harvester um, module at, uh, at Florian or the, the weeding module. So what, what do you think is then needed most and how do you think it, it will evolve in the next future? Well, I think um, with with the different processes and tasks uh, that arise on the farm, there is no module which is more important or less important. Uh, I think uh, what's very crucial is uh, a an interface where uh, everyone can uh, plug into and to combine different technologies onto one platform. Uh, that's why also um, yeah, different stakeholders have to come together to um, yeah, develop something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Florian, you, you showed very impressively to have uh, the Sprout very, very much focused to uh, the very initial application. Yeah, seems to be a really nice fit. Uh, how do you think um, that that will actually evolve? So will you maintain the OEM status or uh, where do you say, OK, this is this is your corner um, uh, and, and you need to um, yeah, have inbound from other technologies, other specialists. So I fully agree with Marta that uh, co collaboration is key. Um, we we looked around and realized, however, that the other technologies that are required to to build such a solution are also in kind of startup mode. So we can't afford to wait around for someone else to deliver a perfect drivetrain, for someone else to deliver a perfect computer vision software, etc. So we decided to um, go the hard way and build it all ourselves, which gave us a lot of development speed and time to market, right? We built this in under one year. Now, going forward, there's a different question here, right? We, we need to get to this point where especially the investment community fully understands that this technology works. Because as you mentioned in the in the introduction, uh, Stefan, right? The once the technology is there, the growers will queue up to get their hands on these machines. It's a game changer. So once we are at that point, I, I completely um, look forward to um, going the route that works best for us and, and and the growers, right? If there are implements that can run on our drivetrain, fantastic. Um, what, what we've noticed though, is that the current in a, like landscape of agricultural implements is really geared towards a tractor that is at least three to four tons, right? And costs itself north of a hundred thousand dollars. Um, if you want to get into the unit economics where you can replace labor, like a, a, a worker in, in asparagus costs you something like five, 6,000 euros throughout the course of a three month season, right? And you can see if I need a $100,000 tractor, a maybe 30, $50,000 implement, that thing has to do a lot of work to be viable. So you then starting to build a combine harvester of 10, 20 tons to get that throughput. And then what are you doing in the field? You're compacting the soil so much that the farmer is again, really sad again. So our approach is low cost, lightweight swarms, and the technology just doesn't exist at this kind of price bracket. And so we're kind of reluctantly in the build ourselves uh, mode. Um, but again, Marta, what you said in terms of the system to plug in, right? Those tools are there. The farm management tools are there. The data visualization platforms are there. And that's what we need to, I mean, this is maybe a call out to all these providers who would love to integrate with the right ones, but for a startup, it's always difficult to choose, right? Where do you spend your resources in integration? One provider covers the UK, the other provider is very strong in Australia. In the US, it's a completely different story. So there is fragmentation on all the software components that, that makes it, there's no Zapier yet for, for um, farm management systems. Unfortunately. Um, uh, so uh, speaking uh, with you as a, as a farmer, uh, Niels, so you provide um, the, the resolution, but what do you expect actually for your own farm? I mean, you're, you're in the 15th generation farmer, so obviously you're, you're planning in long term. 
Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, no, this is really interesting for me. I mean, I have a, I have tons of questions, um, but I, I mean, from a farmer's perspective, you know, the most important time of the season is those actionable times, right? You got to hit the seeding right, and the harvesting is by far the most important for us. I mean, I live in a place where we have a lot of variability in weather, so, you know, and I do cereals. So it's not a high value crop, but, you know, still, this is like, it's time to go. And I guess my question is, you know, you work in high value crops with asparagus, you're going to replace all these hundreds of, of labors. You want to make sure it works too, right? I mean, from my perspective, that's the number one priority. And then, and then I think economics is, is, is just as, just as important. So, um, and I'm also interested to, to find out how this works for small and medium farmers. You know, I think, you know, how I, this is a landscape I don't know well, so I'm just asking, I'm trying to figure out how that will work. You know, I run a medium sized farm and, you know, for me to think about robotics is expensive, but, you know, it's interesting for sure. So. Well, we, we design our machines so that the cost per kilo harvest are equivalent to what people cost you, right? And I think, I mean, this is, this is a very um, ambitious goal because I'm sure that in addition to the labor cost per hour, there are a whole lot of additional hidden costs like a hassle, overhead, accommodation, entertainment, all the things you have to provide, right? Um, so, but, but you're absolutely right, right? I, I can't deliver a solution where, let's say, it costs you um, 50 cents per kilo to harvest with people, and I say it costs 50 euros with my robot, right? That doesn't make any sense. Um, the, the advantage of having small robots, also like the eTerry, right? You don't have to invest a half a million dollar uh, ticket in order to get to get started, right? We we could deliver you one machine that replaces maybe three or five people. Um, but the, the question then is for us um, as, a, as a company with scarce resources, we need to, for now, really focus on the larger accounts like Cobri Farms that have the potential to take up to 100 robots. Um, because for every, as soon as you use one robot, you know, you need to think about, okay, where can I store it? Where can I charge it? How far is that away from my field? Um, and, but technically, I think this is a massive opportunity for all sorts of farm robots that we can, it, is, it works in our favor also from how big a battery do we put on a machine, right? If the machine is big and heavy, the machine dimensions become so vast uh, that it just makes more sense to run a diesel powered uh, generator on your machine. So as long as you stay small, you stay cheap and you stay also by definition available to, to smaller farms. 100 percent that's really interesting can i have a follow-up question do you mind philip it's really interesting for me <laughs> you know, just because like you know the, it's critical right you want to do the harvest you get out there and then i suppose you know i'm thinking also now from a farmer's perspective you want it to you want the machinery to get out there and do its job and it needs to be reliable you know it needs to go and you have all these variabilities i guess with like muddy and wet spots and all this stuff right mm -hmm. so how do you deal with that with the the farmers and delivering this during critical times in the season you know because it's also a risk for them. They're not bringing all 100 people in, they're bringing the robots and it's like, actually okay. go, you know? I think first of all, the, the way that we replace labor is gradual, right? So yeah. no farmer is going to say, I don't get 100 people in anymore. I get like, they're currently working on a shortage, right? They have 50%, 30% shortage. So yeah. every additional robot brings them back some harvest capacity. Yeah. Um, in, in the crops that we're dealing with, the harvest season is very long and you go in there every day. So asparagus, you harvest over 12 weeks every day. So it's not so much of a, I do this service for this farmer today and then I move it all to the next farm. You allocate the agreed number of robots to one farmer for the entirety of the season to do work every day. And then when that season is over, we take our robots back, retool them quickly, and then send them out again for, for example, the, the tenders and broccoli harvest. And I, I think, Philip, to, to your question, the machine that we're designing now has enough ground clearance to also drive over broccoli plants. So the only thing that we are swapping out is the end defector and maybe the box storage solution in the, in the back of the machine. But this needs to be compatible so that uh, you can reuse as much of the hardware on, on different crops. Um, but the, I think the, you know, there's a little bit different for the, for, the, for the selectively harvested field vegetables in terms of the, okay, now the, what do you look at with cereals, the pH value in your, in your grains and now everything go and. Moisture. 
Also. Well, you're exactly right. And and so you have to really get going and within one, uh, before it rains, you have to get it all in. It's different in the vegetable scenario. You just have to make sure that it's consistently available throughout uh, the season and that your harvesting is accurate, right? That you don't cut off too much, that you don't cut off too little, that you don't cut off the wrong things, that you are selecting which one which one needs to go now. And that really is what drives your your yield, right? If you cut off a asparagus too high, photosynthesis continues in the stem and um, the, the, the crown doesn't produce as many new spears. So mm -hmm. if you always deliver an accurate result with your machine, you can expect yield gains just from that. But it's it's a it's, it's a long, long story for every single crop that you're that you're looking at. You can get very, very deep. So it's a lot about learning and and uh, precision. Um, so uh, Niels, maybe you you want to elaborate a little bit on what what actually Digi Farm holds uh, holds uh, on stock for for robotics. And uh, so my overall question would be: So do we need to have not only very specific knowledge or know-how, like like a broad know-how, like Stefan is actually collecting uh, while testing uh, all different machines? Do do we need some some new points of, of infrastructure? Do we need more bandwidth? Uh, do we need um, just the common learning? We need um, insurance. Uh, how about uh, navigation yields? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, the boundary stuff, which I guess is becoming more important with robotics, right? You need to be able to make sure this, this, this machinery is operating under legal boundaries and, you know, it's not getting into any ditches or anything, not like I'm saying that it would, but you need to, so boundaries is only certainly becoming more important. Um, and we just provide a very simple API for, you know, we work with a lot of FMS solutions, but, uh, you know, this is now moving into territory working with, with uh, robotics. And, you know, typically this is RTK based, which is, which is expensive and it's not super scalable. So we want to get our boundary to a point where it's got usable uh, infrastructure for, for robotics. And right now we're working different use cases where, you know, the, the machinery sends a centroid or, a, you know, a long lap point, we do the boundary and then you have kind of an operational point that you can get going with. And specifically for bigger farmers, you know, it's it's a pain point to be able to get on board them to, to use, to have them draw boundaries or have some old shape files. So I think we're just part of the service, but um, certainly just a, just a technology provider at the end. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, so, uh, Stefan, now to, to your position, so you want to learn, you want to learn how, what the actual status of robotics is. Um, so at which point do you, are you, are you actually satisfied and saying, okay, now, now we are, we are getting closer to a machine that actually can, can, can scale. Now, um, so that there are a lot of, a lot of, um, let's say, um, partial problems to solve here. So one of it is, is the farming structure. As, as I mentioned, um, you know, a crop like sugar wheat is grown at, at various completely different structured farms. So you have, for example, in Germany, maybe lots of smaller farmers or in France with a small acreage. Then if you go more to, towards Eastern Europe, Russia, you have farmers uh, more than 1,000 hectares. And um, so you need to define before you start maybe working on such a robot for what kind of customers is this uh, is the solution suited now. Um, and it might be that for these larger um, for, for these larger farms, you really need to think about an efficient swarm of robots or then go back to a um, um, tractor hitch based system um, where you can scale up these modules and we have a higher higher coverage. So this is this is one thing that um, I think it's important for the business cases of the of the robotic companies to see, you know, what what kind of customers can I reach uh, with, with such a system? It will not fit all the customers. And and for us, I mean, we are a seed company. So uh, on one hand, um, we want to support such solutions because um, if, you know, if active in actives, um, let's say herbicides are not available anymore, then um, uh, for a crop like sugar beet, the farmers will just stop growing it. They, they then grow cereals or something else where it's less, um, uh, they have uh, less stress of, of, um, and, and less management costs of, of getting the weeds out of the field. Um, and that's why for us it's also critical to look at and support efficient solutions um, that farmers still uh, grow the crop. Um, and on the other hand, um, 
we can also look at the genetics uh, from, from the breeding perspective. Um, can we somehow combine um, or make our, our crops smarter to, to interact with such uh, new machines? Yeah? Or can we have uh, specific varieties that are you know, most, more better suited um, to, be, um, to be weeded with, with a robotic system? And this is also something, I, I don't know, from the asparagus side. Um, um, are there specific varieties maybe in asparagus? I can imagine that the shape of the asparagus might be um, somehow important. Um, so I, I think for, for breeding companies in general, whatever crop it is, specialty crop or commodity crop, um, um, we have to think about, you know, what does it mean to your crop if we have a future of much more automated uh, farming? Now, and this is also something we specific, specifically look at from a breeding perspective. I mean, it would be nice if the breeding um, development speed would be quicker than what we currently see, right? You're thinking in terms of decades and right. the, of course, it would be nicer if the crop was more uniform, right? If it was straighter, if it was thicker, um, all those things, if it would present better, if in a, other crops the, the, the leaves would um, not cover as much the area where you need to get to. Um, again, collaboration, right? Th these are the kind of long-term co collaborations that make a lot of sense. Right, and yeah, I mean, uh, breeding varieties takes eight to 12 years, so this is quite a, a long development time. Um, maybe in the UK, we uh, let, let's see how, um, how technologies like genome editing will develop in the future. Maybe there's um, a faster, um, let's say implement, implementation of such technologies there, I don't know. Um, I hope so. Um, and, uh, you know, such technologies are needed uh, to, um, to speed up um, crop breeding programs or we, we may see uh, in, in, in countries like the US um, how, how fast this, uh, this comes into the, um, into the ground, let's say, such crops. And I, I think I've also seen in Japan there are now um, a few crops uh, like tomatoes and also fish that has been um, modified with uh, CRISPR-Cas with genome editing that are in the market. So, um, yeah, it, it will be interesting to see, you know, how these different technologies that they from the sensor side, from the robotic side, work together with the with the breeding side. But it's a completely new area, and um, yeah, um, it will be interesting to see how the how it develops. Yeah, in five years we will be smarter, um, but uh, that it, it, a lot of calls for uh, yeah higher uh, agility. Um, Marta, you're you're providing a very versatile driving machine uh, that so one machine fits to all surfaces or conditions. Um, so when you think that you will have the the right concept, the right package um, for one specific um, application. Yes, so uh, it's it's already a science itself to to develop a, a a system that can drive reliably through all kinds of fields. So when you look, um, yeah, at the fields we have in Germany, for example, they are so diverse. The slopes are sometimes ten percent or more, and yeah, with the weather conditions varying day by day, sometimes it's it's hard to to even develop a a robot that can handle that. And that's why I also think that robotics in general is uh, is really usable first in in greenhouses, for example, where you have a a controlled environment and uh, yeah, controlled conditions. That's uh, that's one thing where I would say uh, an, an application is is easier to to get market ready first. Um, yeah, but for, for sure the goal is to uh, to navigate onto the field and uh, have a working application there, which will last like two years in development. But the, the, the nice thing is with you if you have a field robot, right? A sugar beet field, an asparagus field looks very similar from one country to another. When you are, of course, you're close, faster to market if you develop it for one specific greenhouse, but then you go down the road and the greenhouse looks different, right? And so there's this massive opportunity that when something can work on a tractor width field 
where, okay, if it's 150, 120, 180, that's not the big difference, right? If, if you can prove that it works in the open field and you have weather variability everywhere, right? And then you can so quickly scale globally with the right resources. And it's, it's that instead of kind of conquering one greenhouse after, after the other. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. <laughs> um, I also think, I mean, robotics, they really originated in an in industrial context, like an automotive. And uh, I think they first, yeah, kind of need to be trained on how to navigate in harsh terrains and conditions. And this step is done right now. And we see it with, for example, NAYO or Eco Robotics that um, they are starting to really uh, conquer these harsh conditions, but I also think that there's still quite a road to to go. Um, Niels, Flora mentioned before that um, there, there's so much technology out there, but it's not real fitting, it's not custom made. Um, so you're now very, very focused on, a, actually you're, you're focused on boundaries all over the place, but now there's one specific application like robotics. So what is needed that you say, OK, um, th th here's, here's uh, the, the, um, the tool set, just, just go and plug it in. So what is still there needed as, as one example of many other topics like swarm intelligence and these things? From our perspective, for us, to, yeah. for robotics to be able to use our services. Yeah, I think, well, I think the, why there's no one fits all in the FMS market or different markets is because agriculture is so different. You know, it's hugely complex and with loads of variability. So every farmer kind of needs different things. So, and yeah, a boundary is a boundary, but even for us, it's regional based too. So everywhere we go, we have to retrain, you know, our models to be able to delineate boundaries well. So I don't know if there's one, one, what is it? One shoe fits all, whatever you say. But I don't know if there is is such a thing. It's it's um, but 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 certainly we we train we train again everywhere we go. So I think that's the key to be able to get local knowledge and figure out what that market needs. So um, and yes, I, of course, once we've done our you know our heavy work and we have boundaries and the kind of data layers that we do, then it's plug and play for us through an API. So yeah, we try to make it as easy as possible. If, if I if I can jump in here, I think that that's a really important point. Um, you know, we have all these specificities in different farms, um, um, different lo location differences, soil differences, and so on. And um, getting access to these different farmers and then develop your system uh, according to their needs, that's, um, that's quite critical. And especially, you know, getting access to a lot of customers at the end. Um, that's, that's something um, which most startups don't have. You don't have a huge customer base and you can, can get such kind of information. So that's why I also think um, companies like, like KWS, you know, with a global outreach to all kinds of farmers can play an important role here in, in supporting startups and providing on one hand access to farmers, but on the other hand also knowledge about location specific differences that can help to optimize the machines for, let's say, for a, a huge uh, market as fast as possible. Yeah, so you don't want to work on a, on a small problem that only may 1% of the farmers uh, can, can really work with this. You want to have like the largest number of farmers possible um, where, where your system works. And I think that's an important um, role um, from larger corporations in agriculture uh, to provide this information and, and support startups to get quickly into the market. You know? Um, how about standardization? So that also calls for standardization, that this information is available to a larger crowd that um, uh, in the standard way, uh, standard process, the farmers can test these machines and figure out what, what still is needed. Um, Martha, what do you think about standardization? So what you, would you wish um, that comes from I don't know, regulatory side? Um, what are still the, the missing links, the missing the, the gaps that actually the, the robotics world takes off? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I think sanitization at the moment, very, very difficult topic. I would wish that um, the large, uh, the large manufacturers like uh, 
yeah, John Deere or whoever who already have agricultural robots in their portfolio just um, would would lead the way and everyone could jump on and then we just decided it, you know, then we can just move on and uh, yeah, work on our solutions. But right now everyone is literally like cooking their own little soup and <laughs> spicing it differently. Um, what also what would also be a possibility is that uh, on f from a governmental side there would be more um, regulation or more um, yeah building a a way where we 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 can develop into yeah um slowly we are, we are coming to an end so um no, are we are to, the, to the wish list in case turn, anyone... we're turning to the wish list exactly <laughs> Florian. um <laughs> So now we are. We have seen where we are standing right now. We have different solutions. We have already. We are very close to uh, specific applications, um, but the the big big picture is still not not totally painted. Yeah. So we have still have uh, uh, white spots here and there. Nobody knows exactly where the whole system goes for, and. Um, so, uh, Florian, what would be your, your wish um, uh, for, for 2022? Um, what should happen in the robotics field that you say, OK, that was a valuable year? Supply chain, uh, that the global supply chain goes back a little bit more to um, reliable um, parts and lead times and prices. I mean, we, we now get we get an invoice. We know how much a part costs when they ship it. <laughs> not when we order it. Um, I, I think the another thing in the robotics space the government can help is actually finally solve this directive from 2006 about what does it mean to operate something autonomously? How does it have to be supervised? I mean, I get it that a drone can do a lot of damage when it's not flown correctly, but a robot that travels at two kilometers an hour on private land, it's I hope that they solve it soon and that there is some regulation that can be relied upon that insurance companies they can also work with. But currently, every robot manufacturer effectively cannot set up and leave a robot in the field. We always have to watch it. That is, that's a showstopper, right? Um, also, I think for robotics, we're disadvantaged in, in the service model that we need to run versus um, equipment manufacturers where every farmer always gets massive discounts if they buy a new machine uh, they get kickbacks from the government why don't they get kickbacks from for for the service they're using for us right why why isn't this something that uh, government uh, or agricultural ministries think about in terms of supercharging adoption of, of robotics technologies for for farmers if a farmer buys a robot great what is he going to do with it right beyond um, trying it a, bit, a little bit, right? The, the adoption only happens with this kind of service approach where the farmer doesn't have to learn how to operate the robot first, but needs to be able to observe the performance. And, and, and yeah, okay, rant over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, long list. Um, uh, it's obviously also about uh, collecting data. So uh, how about you, Marta? Yeah, I totally agree with the uh, supply chain uh, part. So uh, having a 25 week lead time, you can't build a robot with that. And uh, my second wish would be, yeah, having physical events again in 2022. I'm very sad that the Architechnica is not taking place this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I hope I'm hoping for the summer that um, there will be some some events again where we can show uh, what we what we've got. So Niels, what should happen? Um, how do you how do you precise make make your boundaries more precise or actually apply oh. it to the robotics field? Yeah, well, I was just going to say I want to get a robot in my field. That's all. <laughs> Twenty twenty two. No, I think uh, yeah, no, we're on a continuous quest to get it up to that accuracy. So we got a couple of projects working on now to to work with some machinery and yeah I think this will be exciting to see but yeah no, I'm excited about this space so just just in interesting to follow it and and be be as involved as we can be. Stefan final call. Yeah um, I mean uh, for us as we have already a lot of projects now with different providers uh, in different farms I think these are exciting times 
Um, and also this year, we always, you know, if farmers see these robots in action and they work, like Marta, what you mentioned, having field days, having personal contact. I mean, I hope we get a little bit back to normal now and, and this will help um, um, to, uh, to let people see what, what these systems are, how they, how they work in the field, that this is important. Also the supply chain, I, I see this as well uh, with, with many companies that struggle to get the parts from China and so on. So I hope we get a little bit back to normal here as well. Um, and yeah, uh, travel restrictions. I hope this will be also easier to go to different countries and um, also having having uh, fairs like the Agritechnica, which is now a bit virtual, but you know, it cannot really replace uh, meeting people in person. Um, that this is really um, something I hope we get back to normal soon. Okay, so let's uh, cross our fingers. Um, let's see how it's, how it's evolving. Um, so many thanks for all the participants. Uh, many thanks for for uh, being with us. Uh, many thanks for all the uh, participants um, on on their laptops. Obviously, um, thanks that you joined. Uh, we will uh, provide this video um, on our YouTube channel. We will also uh, conduct the blog article. We are very happy to share all information that uh, the the panelists are offering here. And uh, in, indeed, we, we hope to see uh, all of you uh, at Stefan's uh, uh, live farm test. <laughs> I, I think that was an Welcome. invitation. <laughs> and um, yeah, let, let's see what, what 22, 2022 brings. Many thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks.